Amen. What a joy to be back with you guys. I've missed being with you guys. So thank you for being here this morning. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been really tough. So uh, many of you have been in prayer. Uh, we, we've uh, finished a six, seven week battle up in St. Louis, Missouri. And a lot of you folks were praying for us to have strength and stamina and, and endurance and for truth to come out. And I want to thank you all so much and tell you that uh, it was an interesting uh, event. It was an interesting ordeal. One of the, the things that kind of fits in well with class today were a few events at trial. And I want to make sure that, that the, when we hit our devotionals that we're going to be talking about this morning, our teachings from the life of Jesus, we're going to hit... We're not wading into the shore. We're going to dive into the deep end immediately. We're just going to bam. So that means for the next two or three minutes, I need to like get you all warmed up, okay? Get you ready so that once we get into it. So I thought, how do I do that? Well, an easy way to do that is just to sort of tell you a little bit about this last trial for a few minutes. I can tell you that in the last trial, some of the witnesses um, seem to have a, a, a problem telling the truth. <clears throat> they take an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God. And, and th those of you who don't know about the case, and, and if you work for uh, Johnson & Johnson, and, and uh, I don't want to offend you with, with me telling this, but this is what I believe to be true, and I'm going to tell it, and if it offends you, then you're welcome to email me, and I will talk to you about it personally. But I believe this fervently, and I think it's an important story. We had discovered that the Johnson & Johnson baby powder, for at least the last 50 years, has had a very, very small amount of asbestos in it. The, the talc mines are marbled with asbestos, like a steak is marbled with fat. And you can have fatty steaks, but you can have lean steaks where you don't see a lot of fat, but there's still fat in it. You have, they, I don't think they found a fatless steak yet. Um, it's the same way with talc mines. You can have talc mines with a, a lot of asbestos contamination, but you can also have them that are fairly clean, but you've still got asbestos in them. And, and the FDA doesn't keep up with that, Really, they require the companies to self-police and to self-report. And so Johnson & Johnson has always said, well, our product doesn't have any asbestos in it. And we discovered that it did. And we discovered internal documents that the company knew that it did. And so I, I had the company doctor on the stand. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, you have told this jury what you've told the public. And that is that there is no evidence that asbestos is in your baby powder. She said, well, that's true. I said, no, it's not. And, 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 and she said, well, yes, it is. And I said, but here's a test that was done by Dr. Alice Blount at Rutgers University. She published it. And while the publication doesn't say what sample I was that had the asbestos in it, we know, and J&J &J knew, that sample I was Johnson & Johnson baby powder that she just took off the shelf. She said, well, I don't agree. I said, I know you don't agree with the findings, but you will at least admit that that's evidence that there might be asbestos in the baby powder. So, you know, maybe you could say publicly or say to the jury, I don't believe there's asbestos in it, but you can't say there's no evidence. She said, there's no evidence. She crossed her arms. I said, well, yeah, this is evidence. You just don't agree with the evidence. She says, there's no evidence. I said, well, how about this internal Johnson & Johnson document? where you all say that you can't use these certain testing procedures because if you do, it will show the asbestos in the product. I said, that's evidence, isn't it? No. I said, well, how about when you hired the Colorado School of Mines to do this work for you and to check it? And they wrote you and said you've got asbestos in it. That's evidence, isn't it? No. 
And I said, how, and, and, and I went through, how about the Macron testing agents? How about all of these uh, different people who've tested it? You know, we've got hundreds of tests that show this. Well, that's not evidence. I said, well, what do you think evidence is? She says, evidence is uh, something that indicates something. I said, well, this is evidence. You've got to at least say there's evidence, don't you? And, and I, you know, I, my truth meter with her, I started out, she'd taken an oath to tell the truth. Well, at this point in time, that truth meter's really over here, <laughs> wiggling off a of false. And the jury, talking to the jury afterwards, were so inflamed that people can't tell the truth. And so I was thinking about this in terms of class this morning and I thought, you know, we as, as Christians need to be people of truth. It needs to be an important value. It needs to be something we chase, we pursue, we embrace. When we fall short, we need to, 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 to measure up to it and we need to do better because it's something that we should value. And I think one of the reasons why it's such a marvelous word, and now we're diving in to our devotionals, is because Jesus has cornered the market on truth. I love to read the writings of John because John writes about truth more than anybody else in the New Testament, uh, uh, well, save maybe Paul. Certainly more than the other gospel writers. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at these and we're going to deal with it today. Jesus says in John 14, he is the truth. Look at the passage. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am the truth. That's a profound statement. And now that you're all here and we're all warmed up and we're all ready to go, it is time to learn a foreign language. <clears throat> so here we go. Today, it's not, here's your Greek word for the day. You get Greek. And you get Hebrew both. This is like a twofer. It's like a jelly donut where you get the donut and you get the jelly. So um, I'm not saying which one is the donut and which is the jelly, but you're getting them both. So here we've got it. Now there is a Greek word for truth. Let me see where I am on my screen here. There is a Greek word for truth. The Greek for truth. Are you ready? It's a le thea. All right? In English letters, we would write that a l e, it's a long e, t h e i a, aletheia. And that means truth. So you can look at that word and when you see that word you can translate it the noun truth. Now this is a noun that Matthew uses one time. This is a noun that Mark uses three times. This is a noun that Luke uses three times. Once, Matthew, three, Mark, three, Luke. You've used it. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you've already read it seven times. Then you hit John. John uses it 25 times. And if you go to his three little short epistles, you can add 20 more to it. So you get 45 out of him in the same amount of room that Matthew used it once. It's a very important concept. It means something in the Greek. 
The, the, the Greek word means truth, or you could use it for um, something that is some upright. You know, it's something that, that stands upright. And that's, that's the opposite of false. Not false. That's what aletheia means in the Greek. But John is doing something funny. John uses the word in a very Hebrew sense of the Greek word. You might be saying, I, I, uh, that doesn't make sense to me, okay? At the time that Jesus is alive, the Hebrew Old Testament, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, a sister language. The Hebrew Old Testament had been translated for several hundred years into Greek because as the Jews had moved throughout the Mediterranean world, it doesn't take but a generation for the, the people to become more conversant with the language of the day as opposed to the language of their history. If you take people, for example, who have moved here from Latin America, Spanish may be their primary language, but their children who are born here, who grow up going to school here, will learn Spanish from home, but English will be a primary language of theirs because of the school system. Then you take those children and their offspring come along, generation two in America, and some of those won't even know Spanish hardly at all. So you've now had four, five generations, maybe more, of Jewish people living outside of the Jewish world, living in the Greek world. And Greek was their conversant language. So about 200 years before Jesus, there was a decision that had been made in Alexandria, Egypt, home of the world's largest library in, at the time. And the decision had been made to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. When that translation was done, the word, the Greek word, aletheia, was often used to translate a Hebrew word. So now we need to shift gears and we need to look at the Hebrew word that is behind that Greek word for truth. The Hebrew word that is translated by the Greek word is a word in Hebrew, emet. It's got an E-M-E-T sound. So we would write that in English as emet. E-M-E-T. Whoops. Scoot up there, Amet. There we go. Amet. Now, Amet can mean true, like true, false, truth. But Amet really has another meaning that's much more typical. And, and so we can translate Amet as truth, but it's also frequently translated as faithfulness. faithfulness. You with me? So let me give you an example of why this is important in scripture. But before I give you the example, you got to be tuned in. So that's why I've been talking slow. I want to make sure we're real clear. I'm going to say it one more time. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. A little bit of Aramaic. That's okay. We're not worried about that right now. Let's say Hebrew. 200 years before the time of Jesus, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into what language? Greek. That's called the Septuagint today. But we can just call it the Greek Old Testament. Paul used the Greek Old Testament almost all the time in his writings. Because he was writing, by and large, to Greek-placed Christians... And so when he quoted the Bible, he quoted it out of the Greek Old Testament. Okay? So at the time of Jesus, 
And Jesus, by the way, was at least trilingual. Boom, boom. Yeah, at least trilingual. He may have been quadlingual. But he knew Hebrew. He knew Aramaic. And he knew Greek. So the, 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 the people are aware of this. You got it? So there's a he, Greek word for truth that if you're reading Plato or Aristotle or Herodotus or Xenophon or some of the Greek writers, you see it and it generally just means not false. It means true or it means uh, upright. It can have a moral element to it. But it's used to translate a Hebrew word that means faithfulness. And that faithfulness is really an important concept behind how John uses the word truth. So our Bibles translate the Greek word in John, truth. But when John's using the word with people who knew the Greek Old Testament, he's using a word that in their minds isn't simply truth like we think of a true-false test. But it's truth in the sense of also a faithfulness. And I think John may have especially had a place for this in his heart, more so even than the other gospel writers. Because of a very important event that happened in his life. John was one who was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. Peter, he'd, he'd fled. He was on the run. He was scared to death. But John was there. And do you remember in the crucifixion when Jesus is about to pass from this world into to a physical death. Look at the last words of Jesus that John would have heard. Jesus said, calls out in a loud voice. We're looking at Luke 23, 46. If you're listening to this on the, the radio or, or through an iPod or something like that. Jesus, Luke 23, 46. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I trust myself to you. And then Jesus breathed his last and was dead. Now, John, who'd been with Jesus in an intense seminary course for the last three years, who grew up Jewish, learning his Bible, who could write in Greek or New Greek as well as Hebrew and Aramaic, had to know that Jesus was not just freelancing there on the cross. Jesus is speaking, but he's using the words from a psalm. Psalm 31 Verse 5. Psalm 31 verse 5 is what was going on, I'm sure, in Jesus' mind. As Jesus is walking through this, not physically, he's hanging on a cross, but enduring this for our sake. And Jesus is thinking to God, you are my rock and you are my fortress. Jesus is thinking to God, for your name's sake, you lead me and you guide me. Jesus is prayerful to God, knowing you take me out of the net they've hidden for me. You are my refuge. Into your hand, I commit my spirit. And Jesus dies before he finishes the verse. You have redeemed me. O Lord, faithful God. You have redeemed me. O Lord, faithful God. Now, this scripture has existed in Greek 
for several hundred years at this point. And in Greek, do you know what word is used for faithful? Aletheia. It is the Greek word for truth. So you could also translate it, O Lord of truth, God of truth. But the thrust of the passage is one of emet in Hebrew, faithfulness. And so what, what Jesus, well, what the psalmist says, what Jesus has going through his head and some out of his mouth as he's dying on the cross is you're my rock, God. You're my fortress, God. For your name's sake, you lead me and you guide me. You take me out of the net that they've hidden for me. For you're my refuge. So I'm going to trust myself to you. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me. O oh God, O oh Lord, faithful God. Jesus is saying that in Luke 23. Jesus calls out with a loud voice. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me. O faithful or God of truth. So I want us to see and understand. As we're going through this. That this Greek word that John heard in his brain and associated with the faithfulness of Jesus and the faithfulness of God the Father who resurrected Jesus, who was trustworthy with the spirit of Jesus. John associates those together with truth, aletheia, this Greek word. And so John writes of truth more than all the other gospels put together times three. Because for him it shows the faithfulness of God. Now, you with me? You got that? Maybe. We'll reinforce it as we go along, but that's critical to understanding of these passages in John. So now go back to John 14, 6. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the faithfulness of God. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, you can get that out of the way. That's sentence. Okay, back, beep, 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 back it up. Let's do that again. Don't get that out of the way, but you can understand Jesus saying, I am the way, no one comes to the Father by me, but by me. I'm, I'm the way. That makes sense, doesn't it? But what is this idea, I am the truth, no one comes to the Father but by me? Well, Jesus did not lie. No, that's not what John's saying. John's saying, Jesus is God's faithfulness. Jesus is the faithfulness of God. And it's all wrapped up in the cross where Jesus quotes it from Psalm 31.5. Jesus is the faithfulness of God. In Jesus we see God keeping faith with us, redeeming us. And that's why there's no way to the Father but by Jesus. He is not just the way. Another way of saying it is he is the faithfulness of God. He's the truth, the aletheia in Greek, the emet in Hebrew. Or emuna, another word, a Hebrew word that's closely associated with it for, for the same reasons. That is, that is who Jesus is. That's why there's life in him. If you want true life, he's the way. He is the faithfulness of God. No one's coming to the Father but by Him. When I grew up and I looked at this passage, and when I talked to a lot of people who look at this passage, 
the idea of Jesus being the truth has always been a little weird. It just didn't seem to fit in with everything else he was saying. That's because we're not thinking of it in the Hebrew sense of that word. But that's the sense that we've got it. And, and I don't know how better to show it than to show it with that, that passage out of Psalm uh, or Luke and, and Psalm 31.5. It does a good job. So Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the faithfulness of God and we see it on the cross. Now, I, I've got to borrow from something we did a couple of months ago, maybe six weeks ago. But I got to play it again. It just comes back and haunts me in my, my head. So I want it to haunt you in your head. I want it to be one of those things that you can't get out of your head. We were with our granddaughter yesterday. Had my 40th high school reunion in Lubbock, Texas. Man, did you know those people got old? <laughs> and our granddaughter went with us. And she sang head, shoulders, knees, and toes for a good bit of the day. And I've been singing it nonstop since. I can't get it out of my head. Well, I want to put something in your head. And it's rooted in this idea that Jesus is the truth. He is the faithfulness of God. God promised humanity that he would make a way for us to be with him again. He made that promise thousands of years before Jesus. He told the people prophetically how it would come about. He got it as specific as saying that it would happen in Bethlehem. That it would happen to a virgin. He laid out the cross before the cross ever came to be. God had made those promises. And you know what Bob Dylan says about this. God don't make promises that he don't keep. He doesn't. Jesus is the faithfulness of God. He's the promise God kept. So here's the question for you and me. Do you need God in your life? Do you have a need? Do you have a need? Maybe it's for holiness. Maybe it's for health. Maybe it's for friends. Maybe it's for healing relationships. Now, am I telling you that God's going to do all of that immediately for you? No. If you have cancer, am I telling you God's going to cure your cancer right now? Boom. Forget MD Anderson. No. What I'm telling you is what God promises you. And that is you can commit yourself to him because he's a faithful God who will not leave you alone. And he will deliver you from the fowler's snare. That's the net that catches the birds. He did that for Jesus. But it doesn't mean Jesus did not die. Jesus wasn't removed from the cross until after his death. But he did not go through that alone. He went through that with God. For God's glory and for God's purposes. You got it? So that's the reliance we have. We have a faithful God who's not going to leave us alone. Doesn't mean he takes care of all of our problems like a genie. But it means he's going to teach us and guide us and walk us through them and support us and love us. And bring us where we need to be. Whether that is healing in a physical sense in the here and now. Or whether it is something different. But God don't make promises that he don't keep. Next. All right, this is a really cool usage of the word by John. <clears throat> I want you to find the contrast here. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses. John's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Torah in Hebrew. Greek word nomos law is talking about Hebrew word Torah, law. And the law are the first five books of the Old Testament. 
Those were not in finished form, but in sum and substance given to Moses on Sinai. We know not in finished form because they include events that happened after Sinai, including the death of Moses. But we know substantively that the law was given through Moses. And what John says is, the law is given through Moses, but contrast that to grace and truth being given through Jesus. Now, does that mean that the law is not true? No, the law is true. Well, then what is the but in that? You know, well, the law was given through Moses. There's an inherent, it's not translated, but an inherent but. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Like there's a contrast here. Well, we can see maybe that the law is not grace, in a sense. But something's being set up here. So I want to talk about that something that's being set up here. Let's go back to our diagram. Um, let's, let's do it over here. So remember what our word for truth is going to be. We're looking at it with a Hebrew idea of faithfulness as well. So here we've got um, Moses. So the law comes from Moses. Moses gives the law. What is the law at its root? It's what we're supposed to be doing to walk right before God. Fair? So the law, this is you and me. Well, actually, we'll make that me and we'll make you female. Look, I've learned how to do this now. See? <laughs> Male and female. The female has a skirt. Okay. The female also, it looks like one leg is longer than the other. <laughs> that must make her name Eileen. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. If your name is Eileen or if one leg is longer than the other, I apologize. Um, so, uh, I should not teach on no sleep. Uh, anyway, here we've got you and me. And here we have God. The law is how we relate to God. So this is the law. The law is how we relate to God. Fair? And the law came through who? Moses. Moses. But I want to contrast that. The law is how we relate to God. But how does God relate to us? Grace and faithfulness or truth. So we relate to God through the law. But God reaches down to us through grace and the faithfulness or truth, if you want to use the Greek word, of Jesus. That's why John 1.17 sets it up like a contrast. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, the law is given through Moses. That's how we reach up to God. But grace and truth, God reaching down to us, came through Jesus. Without grace, we're in bad trouble. Without the faithfulness of God, the grace doesn't reach us. So it's in Jesus, the faithfulness, and that we see the grace of God. And this is also why John 1.14 says... The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have beheld it, the glory of God, the truth of God. We see the glory of God in His faithfulness to us in Jesus. Got it? Okay, next one. Embrace the truth. John 8, 31 and 32 is the passage. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in Him, if you abide, means stay, if you abide in my word, 
You're truly my followers, my disciples, my students. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Isn't that a great passage? All right. To get this passage, though, we got to take another step back. What do we know? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What do we know? Well, I'm sorry. We're just Greeking out. Geeking out. Greeking out. So the Greek word for no. It's a great word. Greek for no. Can you, yeah, it's on there. The Greek word for no is ginosko. In fact, look at how it's spelled. Whoops, it's got an I in there. Sorry, that I doesn't dot. Okay, I'm just, I'm telling you. Gnosko. All right, let's do it in English letters so that you got it. G, there's an I, but you can kind of forget that I if you want to because you get an N O S K O. Gnosko. Over time, the G became a K. Whoops. Over time, the G became a K. And the I dropped out. And you just wound up with it like that. No. But our word no comes from that gnosko. That's why it sounds kind of goofy. We could say kno. And it'd sound a little better. That means to know. Gnosko. It means to know. But it means more than that. It's, a, it's an intimate knowledge. It's not surface knowledge. It, it's a, a deep, intimate knowledge. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an awareness that, that goes beyond the surface. It was so um, deeply ingrained in its usage in that way that it was a euphemism. You know what a euphemism is? It's a way you say something that you might want to not use. It's a polite way of saying something that might be awkward to have been said in that company otherwise. So instead of using some crude language, sometimes you use a euphemism. Um, it, the, gnosko was used euphemistically in the Bible and in other places in Greek life. And here's an example of it. Genesis 4, 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and she bore Cain. It says in the Greek, Adam, ekno, which is the, the verb form of this, Egno, you on Eve. So Adam knew Eve. Well, it wasn't, I'm aware of who you are. And all of a sudden she was pregnant. <laughs> it was a euphemism because the word no in the Greek means an intimate knowledge. And it's not just used that way in the Old Testament translation into Greek, but you'll see it in Matthew 1.25 as another good example of this. Matthew 1.25. It's talking about um, Joseph and Mary. And um, all of this takes place so that uh, what was spoken through the prophet uh, uh, would occur. And it quotes uh, Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she'd given birth to a son. It means they had, didn't have a sexual intimacy. So this word know means more than simply um, an, an intellectual awareness. 
It is a deep intimacy. It's a relationship word oftentimes. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, Jesus says to the Jews who believed in him, if you're truly my disciples, you will know. That's not an academic knowledge of an academic subject. We are not saved because of what we know. We're saved because of who we know. This is not a passage that says, okay, here's a set of doctrines and beliefs, and once you get these down, you've got salvation. If you get them right. That's not what Jesus is saying here. We know from having dealt with John already what he means by truth, the faithfulness of God. But he's saying, if you're truly my disciples and you abide in what I'm telling you, then you're going to know, you're going to have an intimate relationship with the faithfulness of God, which is Jesus Christ. And that relationship with the faithfulness of God is one that will set you free. And it does. So Jesus is speaking here of a close relationship with God, not knowledge of a body of truth, a set of facts or doctrines. He's talking about it being in an intimate relationship with his followers. When he says this, this is talking about Jesus. So we need to embrace the truth. We need to embrace Jesus. And when we do that, then we find the freedom. He said, well, uh, you know, the Jews, we, we, we haven't been in bondage to anybody. I'm sitting there thinking, did you read Exodus at all? But all of that was just a, 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 an illustration of the bondage we have to sin. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but sin is extremely sticky. It's really hard to get out of it. In the 19th century South, there was a sage African-American man named Uncle Remus who told incredibly profound truth. I put him up there with Aesop and Aesop's fables. He would tell stories about Brother Fox and Brother Rabbit. Now, Uncle Remus was written in the language sound of African-American slavery in the South in the 1800s. And so if you're reading it in the um, uh, first edition, second edition, before it's been um, rewritten for our ears today, some of it's hard to understand reading it. You've got to read it out loud to catch the, the, the words to hear. So like you read Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox, but that's just the way that they said brother. So it's Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox. And that was Brother Rabbit, Br'er Fox. So they, Uncle Remus told this story about... Uh, Brother Fox trying to catch Brother Rabbit, and he knew Brother Rabbit was just curious and always getting into trouble. So he made a baby out of tar and set it by the side of the road. And Brother Rabbit comes hopping along, and he looks in and says, Hey, I hadn't seen you before. What are you doing here? Well, this is, this is a baby made out of tar. It can't talk. So the baby's just, the tar baby is just there. Brother Rabbit says, hey, I'm talking to you. Answer me. The doll doesn't answer. Brother Rabbit says, you answer me, I'm going to wallop you. Baby doesn't answer. Wallop! And his hand's stuck in the tar. Brother Rabbit says, let go of my hand. Baby doesn't say anything. You, you let go of my hand or I'm really going to wallop you. Won't let go of the hand. Wallop! Now both hands are stuck. I'm going to kick you to kingdom come if you don't let my hands go. Won't let the hands go. Pop! Both feet are now stuck. 
And along comes Brother Fox and says, yeah, 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 I got you. Because, and, and, and sin is that way. It's like that baby made out of tar. And we just stop and dally with it. And we don't realize what it is. It's, it's an incredibly profound story. I mean, look at Philippians 3.19 is one of the examples that I gave. That's where Paul talks about people whose God is their appetite. I mean, there's nothing wrong with eating. Eating is necessary as a sustenance of life, but there comes a point in time where, God can be, where, where your appetite can become your God. You're gluttonous. You know, the, sin is just that way. Sexual intimacy has its time and place. But you can take it and abuse it outside of its time and place. There's hardly anything that's not holy and right and good that can't be abused if it's not used right or walked in properly. Sin is sticky. Sin is sticky. And we need help. You can't get out of it on your own. You, 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 you can't get out of it on your own. But there's freedom in Jesus. Now, unfortunately, we've got two minutes left in class, so I don't have time to tell you how. But I can tell you this. <laughs> Keep coming to class, and we'll talk about this. And don't give up, because God don't make promises that he don't keep. And there is redemption in him. The key for you right now is don't miss him. Don't be like Pilate. So you're a king? Jesus says, this is what you're saying for this purpose, this is the way I'd rather say it, Jesus says, for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth, the faithfulness of God. Jesus came to bear witness to the fact that God will keep his promises and God will be faithful. And when he says that to Pilate, Pilate's response is, what is truth? Poor Pilate. He's standing in front of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. The truth beyond all truths. The faithfulness of God that will happen once in the entire history of humanity. And Pilate is so blind to the truth that he wants to debate what it is instead of embracing who it is. He's so wrapped up in an idea he missed what was right in front of him. We don't have time for this, but um, I'd love to find time to get to this with you at, at, an, at another appropriate point because there's more to be added. Um, we live in a 21st century when there, there are real issues with the, the, the folks. Well, here's the passage that I would use. Um, Bob, Bop, bop. When the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth. We live in an age where we've got a generation that's growing up what would be termed morally relativists, relativistic. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of thing where they would rather have tolerance than truth. In other words, here's a Truth used to be Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum in Latin. I think, therefore I am. But now we live in an age that's post-truth, where it's, I believe, therefore I'm right. And we were, Becky and I, in two weeks, I will hate not being with you in two weeks. I really hate being gone, and I'm sorry this summer's been so busy. But in two weeks, we're speaking to the, the Board of Regents of a, of a Christian university for a weekend retreat and, and the administration of this Christian university at their retreat. And, and they've asked us to speak. How do you teach this moral, this, this morally relativist generation truth? When this is a generation that values tolerance over truth. And my answer is going to be pretty simple. 
It's going to be, you don't. You just teach Jesus. Because Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth. That even applies to the next generation. They just need to embrace Jesus. And there's a marvelous, marvelous quotation that's out on the internet. The truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose. It will defend itself. Dash St. Augustine. The problem with that is, it's a beautiful saying. I agree with the saying. It wasn't St. Augustine who said it. So, you know, kind of a problem there to say, just let the truth go. By the way, I'm lying about who said it. Okay. Um. <laughs> hey, Spurgeon says something close to it. So maybe we just say it that way. But the key is, Jesus is the answer. Amen. The faithfulness of God is the answer to all that ails you, our generation, the generation before me, and the generation after me. And every generation that will exist until the Lord returns. Whoops. <laughs> sorry, that's on the slide. You got to boot that down, yeah. So, uh, sorry, that was left over from like a couple of Sundays ago. Um, so if we turn down the volume, I'll bless you in the name of Jesus and we'll go home. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you from the depths of my heart that I'm back with my brothers and sisters today to, to get to share your word of your faithfulness in Jesus Christ. May we walk in that, Lord. Give us redemption not only from eternal sins, but Father, help us in the stickiness of this life to find the deliverance that comes from the blood of Jesus in the here and now as well as in the age to come. May your spirit guide us in truth. Guide all who are listening. Teach them that there is truth, Father, faithfulness, reliability, historicity in you. We lean on you wholly through our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys for this morning.